Welcome to the Care to Listen podcast, where we interview frontline workers and healthcare experts who will share their stories and passions. This is a podcast to let you know that you're not alone. The goal of this series is to reduce the mental health stigma in healthcare and provide accessible support for caregivers just like yourself. Today's episode is being broadcasted to you on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Care to Listen podcast. Uh, Today I'm joined by an incredible guest, Heather Cook. Welcome, Heather. Thanks, Sean. Great to be here. Yeah, we're so fortunate. I mean, somebody who has more than 25 years of experience in dementia care, both as a frontline worker and in your research capacity and, and part of the Alzheimer's Society of BC, you know, could you share a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? Absolutely, absolutely. So my current position is as Provincial Coordinator, Knowledge Mobilization for the Alzheimer's Society of BC. What I do is make sure that everything we do at the Society is underpinned by research. So our programs, our policies, our initiatives um, are all supported by evidence-based research. So as an academic, or when I was an academic, we always want to make sure that the research that we do actually lands in the hands of those who can use it. So I've always said that, you know, the, the, my reason for being is to make a difference in the lives of those who live with dementia and those who care for them, be they folks in the community or in long-term care settings. And so I've been very fortunate to have had a career that has allowed me to do that. For you personally, was there a story or a mission behind this? Many years ago, when I started as a home support worker, I would uh, visit an older couple. They were both in their 90s. Uh, The husband was uh, visually impaired and his wife had dementia and they didn't have children and were still living in community. So I went in two or three times a week and I cooked them dinner. And Mm. while I had learned about dementia uh, as part of my undergraduate degree, which is in psychology, I hadn't really experienced hands-on what that was like, what that looked like. And so Mrs. Brown, a lot of the things she would do, you know, she would misplace things. She would put things perhaps in, in places they didn't belong. I'd open the fridge. I'd find the iron in the fridge or mail in the fridge. or um, And so she and her husband were, were muddling along as, as best they could. But it really intrigued me. Um, was fascinated by it. And I started to work with a few more individuals uh, in my role as a home support worker. And and I absolutely loved the work. I think one of the things that individuals living with dementia can really teach us is about the power of living in the moment. Mm. And it's always a lot easier as um, someone who's working in long-term care. You really just see the person for who they are in the moment. You don't have that history. You don't see necessarily the losses. That's something I know, Heather, that it shines through every time I, I talk with you and just the passion for the work that you're doing. When we talk about workplace civility, help us situate what workplace civility is in the first place, maybe. Workplace incivility is really one of the most pervasive forms of antisocial workplace behavior. And yet its subtlety makes it really difficult to detect. Uncivil behavior really is, it's notably mundane. Like it's things like rude behavior, condescending behavior, ostracizing or exclusionary behavior that otherwise appears as everyday interaction. Um, But over time, our exposure to that incivility, witnessing that incivility, being the recipient of that incivility, just creates this downward spiral. And so it results in an organizational climate of incivility. And for those who are working in care, and particularly in long-term care in, in care homes these days, the work is difficult enough. And then when we layer incivility on top of that, it can make it really hard for folks to actually want to come to work. And when we think about the health human resource shortage that we're experiencing, we need to do everything we can to keep the staff we have And so it really behooves us to find a way to support staff with this difficult work that they they do. And part of that begins with creating a more civil workplace environment. Absolutely. And I I love hearing those examples. I think a lot, again, our listeners can relate 
whether there's staff shortages, um, the rude behavior between, or, you know, just those small little passing comments, um, you know, that slowly over time erode that trust, erode that connection and the ability to, to really build teamwork. So when you're talking about, you know, system factors that maybe create the incivility in the workplace, how would you say, you know, is there a gender lens? I know a lot of your research focused on you know, some of those nuances, but I'm curious, like, how does gender play in workplace incivility? As many of your listeners, those who work in, in the field, will recognize that long-term care is a very gendered work environment. So it's primarily women who are caring for women. So our residents in care homes are primarily women and those who care for them are primarily women. And those who care for them are often racialized. They come from um, ethnic minorities. They're really seen as the, the low person on the, the workplace hierarchy. And so when I started to, to interview staff, uh, they would talk a lot about, well, it's just women being women. And I can think of, of one story that was relayed to me. Um, uh, Carried was talking about how at a previous work site, one of the men had, had come in and had put a plate of chicken feed down on the table in front of them in the break room and said, you know, this is for you. You're just a bunch of, of hens clucking about and pecking at each other, like mm. pecking, just like hens do. So it's not just women who necessarily perceive themselves that way, but it was their their colleagues, their male colleagues who did as as well. And so the, the challenge is that if we think that it's just due to gender, then it allows that bad behavior to continue because it's seen as an inherent trait. It's just inherent to women and it's just something you have to put up with uh, as part of your work environment. And so when we think in terms like that, then we might not necessarily take those steps to actually say, well, no, you know what? This shouldn't be um, part and parcel of this working environment. And we need to find a way to address this and to make it so that, so that we're working in a more collegial, um, positive environment, a more civil environment, if you will, as opposed to an uncivil one. And so in a situation you then think about in a, in a workplace setting, where you don't have much power, you're not earning very much money, you you might be, you know, you're likely come from an ethnic minority, so you, you have very little social power. And so how do you then try and, and gain power in that workplace setting? And often that becomes how, you know, it colors our interactions with others. It's funny for me to think that maybe 25 years ago was the golden age of care, because in many ways, there were many other aspects and challenges that we face. But you fast forward 25 years, and because of the staffing shortages that the industry faces, if you call in sick, your teammates start to say, well, you weren't here to help us. So when that individual comes back to work, we're not helping you. And so you create this sort of spiral. And yet these are, these are circumstances that are sort of outside of the control. I mean, it's, it's not really that individual's fault for taking a day off sick. It's the fact that there are no staff to replace her. And management at the same time are doing their best to fill those positions. So it just creates this, these environments that are just ripe for, uh, for incivility. And then, of course, there's the, there's the whole piece around where someone might call in sick, but they wanted to attend a Canada Day parade or they wanted to go to a concert. And they then post that on social media. And so that gets seen by their colleagues. And, of course, then that just um, further exacerbates that incivility because then you've got um, someone going to management and saying, did you know, you know, Josie was at a concert and she wasn't at work and, and it just becomes this really toxic environment. Today's episode of this podcast is sponsored by SafeCare BC. SafeCare BC is an industry funded nonprofit association working to ensure injury free, safe working conditions for continuing care workers in BC. SafeCare BC strives to be the industry leader in advancing injury prevention and safety training for long-term care and home support workers through cost-effective training, educational services, and industry safety performance information. 
SafeCare BC also relays government health and safety legislation and policies which impact their members. How do you, you know, work with different managers? How do you work with those care homes to try to mitigate some of that incivility that is being created or conflict that's being created? So often incivility, or we might, we might even call it relational aggression, because that's what it is. It's this relational aggression that's occurring between workers, is that it's only readily visible to those who are immersed in it. So if we have a, a manager who, you know, they're dealing with their own issues in care these days and might not be able to be on the unit and might not have a presence on the unit as much as they perhaps should be, then they're not picking up on these underlying tensions that are occurring, this relational aggression that's occurring but between staff. So thinking about, okay, maybe management needs to have a bit more of a presence on the unit so that they're fully aware of, of what is what is going on. And I think also acknowledging that everyone comes to work with a different uh, a level of baggage. So some of us, when we show up in the mornings at work, we come in and our baggage is neatly stowed in a purse and it's tucked underneath our arm. And sometimes we come in and we are pulling our, our fully loaded suitcase wheelie bag in with us. And those can, you know, any, any number of reasons. We've got a toddler at home who's been up half the night, or we've got a baby who's teething, or we've had a fight with a spouse, all of those things. And so what we really need to do is think about how we create space for people to be honest, to people to be kind, for people to check in with one another. And so, you know, creating that culture of civility. And so what we heard when we, when we did the research, we were very fortunate to have an advisory group. So we had representatives from a Safe Care BC, industry partners. We had um, folks from the health and safety, occupational health and safety uh, for BCGU, um, the BC Government Employees Union, from the Hospital Employees Union, from the BC Nurses Union. And as we were sitting there talking, we thought, you know, what we really need is, is some kind of toolkit. We need to equip people with the resources to be able to address this um, because there are no resources. How, how do people go about addressing this? And so that was kind of the genesis of of our workplace in civility toolkit, which is launching this month, February, uh, and it'll be located on the the Safe Care BC website, and it's called Civility Matters. And so, what we've tried to do is pull together uh, resources, scenarios, um, some kindness cards, if you will. Um, we've got templates on there, so you can download. Um, little cards that you can leave for your colleagues to say, hey, thanks for being you. Thanks for doing this great work that you do. You're awesome. Keep it up. And it's all about trying to infuse our workplaces with a bit more of that, that positive bent. And how do we create that, that civil environment? That's so great. And I think it's so needed, not only, you know, in the healthcare industry, but also too across this entire world, kindness. Um, I mean, it's such a simple thing to do, but sometimes can be very difficult. Back to when we were doing the research and my own, ex my own experiences um, working on the front lines is uh, at shift change, uh, when staff, you've got staff leaving, new staff coming in, and, and often there's a report. So you're, you're sharing an update on, on the residents. And one of the first things that we talk about is, is um, who's had a bowel movement? We launch into that. <laughs> um, and we launch into the, the clinical care pieces. But sometimes I think it would be so helpful if we just took a step back for a moment and just during those first few minutes said, just want to check in with folks and see how you're doing today. And getting a sense of, you know, is, the, is, is your team member coming in today with that purse tucked under her arm, or are they trundling their wheelie bag behind them? And that's that opportunity to say, you know, I had a really rough night last night. I'm not, I, I'm not on my A game today. So anything that you can do to sort of, you know, help me or know that if I leave wet towels in a residence room or I miss shaving, you know, Mr. Jones, um, it's not intentional. It's I, I'm just not firing on all cylinders today. And I think if we create these that environment where folks are able to have those honest conversations and to say that, you know, it's not because someone's being lazy. 
there's there's a reason for that. And that just allows us to extend that little bit of compassion. Are there other moments maybe where different people on shift might experience something that then they carry with them the rest of their shift that, oh, if they could just take a moment to themselves or just clear their, you know, their mind or their thinking that it might change the way they can continue on with the rest of their shift and how they ultimately support and provide great care. Um, You know, we often talk about care work being unskilled. And it's not. Anyone who's ever had to toilet a 235, 250 pound man uh, with advanced dementia knows that there is skill to getting that individual Mm. into the toilet to be able to toilet them. And it's work that requires teamwork, um, a lot of teamwork. Uh, Otherwise, you're putting yourself at at risk of injury. So we want to do everything we can to help folks um, be able to draw on, on each other, to be able to support each other rather than going it alone because it that just makes the work that much more difficult and, again, puts puts that individual at risk of, of injury. I think one of the things we need to keep in mind when we're, we're talking about workplace incivility is that the conditions of work are often the conditions of of care. So we want to make sure that we do all that we can to allow staff to bring their best selves to work. Because what that means is then that the residents are also um, getting great care, right? We're creating those conditions that allow staff to flourish. In terms of thinking about, about workplace and civility, giving folks access to the toolkit, it's our way of of being able to support their conditions of work to improve those conditions of work that then are going to impact the conditions of care. So it's a win-win for everybody. We end up with staff who are um, much more cohesive, who are able to work as part of a team and really enjoy coming to work. And the residents are the ones that also benefit from that. Maybe I'd love to talk a little bit about what that toolkit is, what's involved, who it's for, Uh, Let's start with that. What is the toolkit? What's in it? Right, right. So the toolkit um, really has, it's got a couple of key sections to it. We've tried to set it up that you don't necessarily need to work through it in order. You can, like the pages, the web pages flow in a certain order. But we really wanted to recognize that often staff um, don't have a whole lot of time in, in their day. We've talked about the time pressures. So when you land on the homepage, we have two kind of entry points. And one is for uh, frontline staff, so healthcare aides or dietary aides, folks who are working on that hands-on. And then we've also got uh, the other entry point is for management or administrators or for team leads. And once you you enter in through that, um, through clicking on that button into the portal, the first place you land is a little bit of an explanation about what is workplace incivility, and then uh, some self-reflection about what have I actually witnessed as um, a staff member working in long-term care? And are there some behaviors that I might have done that are you know, uncivil behaviors? Because all of us have bad days. There's a lot of good people out there, but sometimes we don't act always accordingly with how we, how we should. And then from there, as I uh, alluded to earlier, we have these kindness card templates. So they say, you know, thanks for being, thanks for being you. We so appreciate the work that that you're doing. And so they're business sized cards and we've set up uh, templates on the site so you can download them. Uh, You can either order them from a, a card site like Vistaprint, or you can buy the, the, a paper that you slip in your printer from Staples. Uh, We've tried to make it really easy and accessible. And the idea being that you're just spreading a little kindness around your your work environment. And uh, my colleague, Rhonda Croft, came up with this idea uh, a number of years ago. And we uh, did up the cards. We were doing a, a presentation at the Hearts and Hands conference in October, last October with Safe Care. And folks were so excited to get their hands on. We had a bunch made up and, and took them with them. We took, developed 11 scenarios that are based on some of the behaviors that we witnessed during the research. And then we uh, we've pilot tested those. We've talked with, with 
healthcare aides and those working in long-term care with uh, managers as well about, you know, does this resonate with you? And that the scenarios seem to. So, and folks can click on, on which answer they think is right. And there's a little bit of an explanation about, you know, maybe that's not the best way. Perhaps this might be a better approach to think about. So we have those. And then uh, sort of to, to round out the toolkit, we have a whole slew of resources. So we've included things like TED Talks on how to have a difficult conversation, or we've got uh, short articles about what is incivility or how, how, what are some steps to addressing incivility? What are things that you can do? And everything that we've put in those resources, um, we have put a, a, a time uh, marker with them. So if you've got five minutes, you could read this article. You know, this article is a 10 minute read. This is a 10 minute TED talk. This is a 30 minute podcast. And uh, so folks can kind of adjust accordingly, depending on, on what their time looks awesome. like. And I so, think that's so, so important. I mean, we know that everybody's super busy. We know that that's, you know, some of the challenges is we have all this great content, great resources, but we just don't have the time. Um, so to see that and to be able to have that as an indication of this is only going to take a couple minutes. But I think mm -hmm. what's great about this toolkit, at least my biggest takeaway from it, is that you've created ways for people to move forward as well. So it's one thing to become aware of what's happening, but it's another mm -hmm. thing to express and to help people with language, with simple language, with simple ways to connect through those kindness cards. Is there a one main takeaway that you'd want people to leave here today with? This work is difficult and we need to find ways to come together, to connect, to extend that kindness and compassion. Stop talking about is women being women, right? About really not excusing that behavior or, or saying, oh, it's just so-and-so's personality. Those are immutable characteristics that we can't change. And yet we can. We can change how we show up in the workplace. And, you know, our hope is that folks will use the toolkit to be able to change how they show up in the, in the workplace, to have a little bit of more awareness about the, how they're showing up. We definitely applaud you in the work that you've done, the translation into helping the, the frontline workers, and ultimately you know, you continuing to give back to, to this world. So thank you so much for, for coming today, Heather. We wish you all the best and we look forward to releasing the, the toolkit and seeing everybody make use of all that great work. Thanks for coming today. Wonderful. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so much for the conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit the links in the show notes for more resources and supports for the Care for Caregivers program. If you're interested in sharing your story on the Care to Listen podcast, please reach out to us at careforcaregivers.ca forward slash podcast. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform to be notified of when new episodes are released. Thanks again for joining us and see you next month.